Hey everyone, welcome to Alex's review of Fairy Tale for the Nintendo Switch. This is a long review, so let's jump in and see what he thinks. Just a brief introduction, as many of you will know, Fairy Tale is based on the hugely popular manga and anime of the same name, and as such I had to call upon a little assistance from my dear old brother who has actually watched the show, so I could get the perspective from someone who knew the story and characters, and someone who didn't, me being the one who saw it all for the first time with fresh eyes. That being said, Fairy Tale, yep, no subtitle, suffers from the same fate that a lot of anime games do, that aren't either Naruto or Dragon Ball Z, in that the Fairy Fairy Tale series actually had several games come out in Japan exclusively prior to this game. Games that told the story from the very beginning, with this one starting off right before a time skip in the middle of the series, meaning that for newcomers like me, it was even harder to follow. Had I not had my anime expert of a brother sitting beside me, uh, and even then him having to cram 250 chapters of plot and character relationships into my poor membranes, it was a lot to take in if not an outright impossibility. He did try to give me the broad strokes, but when he saw that the game started with the battle against Hades, followed by the time skip that I mentioned before, we both quickly agreed that the game, being the first fairy tale game to release in the West, should have at least featured some kind of introduction movie to get newcomers up to speed. You aren't gonna know who any of these people are, or what has happened up till this point, lest you have watched the anime beforehand. The game does allow you to read up on the story so far in certain characters' houses, but that honestly doesn't give it many brownie points from me. With that out of the way, it falls to me today to tell you a lot about if Fairy Tale is worth your time and money as a game in itself, if it makes its fans proud, or is it just another quick license cash grab. Let's start with the story. Like I said before, we start in the middle of the series with our heroes Natsu, Lucy, Grey, Urza and their other friends as they face off against the third guild master Hades who joined the dark side because he believed it had shown him the ultimate truth or something. They eventually beat him through the power of friendship after which, in a last-ditch effort to destroy them, he summons the all-powerful dragon, Acnologia, in order to eliminate them along with the entire island. But before he can do that, the friends gather to use their magic to escape the attack by sealing themselves away, thus skipping seven years into the future, in a time where everyone has forgotten about them and their famous guild. So, our characters have to work their way not only up through the ranks to make their guild fairy tale great and renowned again, but they also have to work themselves into shape as well. Having played through the entire game's story and checking with my trusty advisor, I can confirm to those that are curious that the game covers the end of the Tenro Island arc, then touches on the X791 arc, covers the Grand Magic Games arc, and mentions the Sun Village arc, covers the Hatteras arc, and ends with the Avatar arc, though some details are skipped over or altered, likely due to budget constraints. For the sake of newcomers though, and the length of this review, trust me we have a lot to cover, I won't go into further plot details to avoid spoilers, so let's move on. The gameplay. As with many shonen game adaptations, you'd think Fairy Tale, with all its colourful heroes who sport their own unique magic powers and battle skills, would be a full on arena fighting game like Ultimate Ninja Storm or Kill the Kill If. But to my surprise, this is actually a turn based RPG. When the game starts for real, you begin in the town of Magnolia, lifted straight from the anime, and then move around to various other areas that will be unlocked on the world map as you go along with the story. Areas that, although a bit small individually, are open for you to explore. Here you can collect items on the ground, which will always be placed in the same location every time you return, you fight monsters, and make your way to the current objective. Enemies, as has become the norm in RPGs these days, roam the landscape in plain sight and will approach you when near. They can be in several stages of awareness, with one exclamation mark meaning that they're aware, three meaning that they're going to attack you, and a question mark that they've lost sight of you. If you manage to get the preemptive on them by attacking them before they touch you, you are granted a speed advantage and then begin the battle. The order of attacks, of course, goes by the fastest character to the slowest, and whenever it's your turn, the character in question gets the choice between either attacking with just their bare fists, using items, using magic attack, or defending, each assigned to one of the face buttons. Attacking, regardless of the character, is by far your weakest choice of offense, and you will most likely only use it if, say, the enemy has only a slither of health left, 
and you don't want to waste MP on them. Items is kind of self-explanatory. Here you can choose between an assortment of remedies to aid yourself in battle if you're in a pinch that your characters can't handle with just their moves like restoring health, recovering magic or ailing status effects. Defending allows you to, well, defend. Special attacks is where the real fun begins. As you may have already guessed, you start off with only a few moves, of course lifted straight from the anime, like Natsu's Fire Dragon Iron Fist, but as you level up you quickly unlock more, and I mean quickly. By level 16, I had already unlocked a good variety of cool and flashy moves that all had various effects and areas of attack to deal with almost any situation. When you hit the special attack command, you are immediately led into a submenu where you've got your growing assortment of moves to choose from. Each one, aside from having a cool name to go with it, is accompanied by a grid that shows which tile of enemies it's going to hit and what effect, if any, it will have. And the colours, ranging from red to orange and yellow, indicates the power of the attack, with some attacks only hitting a single enemy, some hitting two in a horizontal row, some in a cross shape, some pushing the enemy back one space to allow for one of your other characters to land a good hit on them etc and if an attack covers a large area it will lose power the further the attack spreads. In that way you really gotta take your whole team and their movesets into consideration not only being conscious of whether your enemy is equipped for the job regarding strengths and weaknesses but you also gotta play as a team trying to make sure that whatever you do as one character will be to the benefit of the next. In this submenu, a mark will also indicate whether an enemy is weak, neutral, or resistant to the highlighted attack. Later in the game, you'll be introduced to character relationships. As you progress and unlock more friends in your team, you are granted the freedom to, by the push of a button, choose between any of the characters currently on your team as your avatar. And then as that avatar, you will sometimes be able to interact and grow your relationship with certain other characters who have a node over their heads. You can do this up to three times between all characters, meaning there are a lot of combinations, and the stronger a character's relationship with another is, the better they will perform together in battle. Going back to what I said about benefiting each other, when you raise your bond with other characters, these will be able to do chain combos with you and even do follow-up attacks. About halfway into chapter 2, uh, yes the story is divided into chapters with 9 in total and further episodes within those chapters, anyways your characters get the ability to, upon filling a dedicated meter underneath their icon, go into an awakened state that enhances their attacks for a few turns and in some cases, like Natsu, completely alter their appearance. The awakening meter is far more than just awakening though, as with other mechanics that I already talked about where you help your teammates, consuming parts of the meter will allow you to perform the follow up attacks that I mentioned before where during let's say Lucy's attack a prompt may appear for Natsu and Grey where pushing their respective buttons will make either of them attack after her which does not waste their own turn. If your awakening meter is full you will also be able to counter with it rendering you immune to the attack but in return your awakening state will be shortened. During battle you will undoubtedly notice a big circular meter in the bottom right corner. This, when filled up, is where your chain combos come into play. By pushing R, you'll be given a series of options to either continue the combo with the next character or end the combo prematurely with a finisher that will cover the entire area. This maneuver is great for when you're in a pinch against a group of strong opponents and if the right prompt appears, an extreme magic attack will even occur in place of your regular finisher with a spectacle to behold. Like all other techniques in the game, you can of course unlock a variety of these by perhaps upgrading your guild. A cool thing the latter also contributes to is that sometimes you will find destructible blockades in the environment. If you do a battle near them and do certain overall amount of damage throughout the encounter, you may end up destroying it, revealing a new path in the area, opening it up for further exploration. Later in the game, around chapter 5, unison raids or combination attacks will also be introduced, where certain characters, if both are awakened at the same time, can do one mega powered super attack together. Fans will recognize some of these from the show, while others are new to this game. Speaking of teamwork and combos, not only did I get a slight Chrono Trigger vibes from it from the way leveling up can unlock not only new techniques but stronger variations of old ones as well. But this game being developed by Gust who also were the people behind my guilty pleasure Knights of Azor 2, the whole friendship mechanic also seems awfully familiar, while not exactly the same. In that game, raising your friendship with certain characters would make your combo attacks with them more powerful, where in this game it grants various benefits like 
like reducing magic consumption during chain attacks or making up a follow attack stronger. I should also mention that since magic is a big part of the game, you will regain a bit after each successful fight, making sure you don't run out too quickly. Oh, and something worth noting, even fallen party members receive experience points from a battle. I only learned that just before finishing this through, since I never got a game over once. Not to say that the game is overall too easy, oh no, monsters late in the game can whoop your ass if you're not careful, but I was over leveled almost throughout the whole game, since I'm the type of player who kills everything in my path and does every single side quest before moving on with the story. While on the surface, Fairy Tail does appear as your standard run-of-the-mill RPG with repetitive battles, which you can thankfully set on auto, which was especially helpful when I was grinding or taking on missions, the further I got into the game and thought that I'd seen everything and got on a grasp of the game's overall mechanics, something new was thrown at me, either new attacks or new techniques altogether, and I couldn't wait to explore and develop more. Like I just said, missions are a big part of the game as well, as I open with, the gist of the story is that Fairy Tail need to climb up the ranks again. This is done via the story of course, but also taking on jobs at the request board, granting different rewards like money, sorry jewels, and materials that you can either sell or use for synthesis to create things that will raise your stats and aid you in battle while equipped. Some missions will just be your generic monster slaying shebang, while others are character specific mini quests. A job well done will not only earn you moolah materials and let you climb the ranks, but will also earn you guild credit that you can use to rank up your party members. Each can climb up 10 ranks in total with 4 and above being locked behind story progression and specific character events that you can sometimes engage in when a star appears above a character's head, once again to learn more about the character and deepen your bond with them. Using points to rank them up will then grant them extra passive benefits in battle like greater resistance to certain attacks or elements. I already told you that clearing missions will allow your guild to climb the ranks, but fulfilling specific conditions like taking on a certain amount of jobs or raising your bond with X amount of characters it will also affect your rank and allow you to take on higher requests. Adding to this, you can upgrade and remodel the facilities with the guild itself, and each upgrade, beside letting you buy or synchronize better items, will also have passive effects on your team as a whole, like increasing the amount of XP members not currently in the party received per battle. You start out with only 3 facilities, but also more will later become available that will grant your team even more passive abilities like the bar where consumption of various liquids will grant you temporary stat buffs. One could say that there's too much to keep track of here, and way too many ways to enhance and micromanage your team and guild as a whole. But there is no rush, and I personally didn't find it all too overwhelming. You just need a moment to let it all sink in. The game features 16 playable characters, and for a game so late into the show's life, I at first thought that that was a joke. But, you know, thinking about it, for an RPG where you spend so much time with each individual character, 16 is just enough, I find. Enough that you don't get overwhelmed, and that unlocking new characters through the story happens just rare enough that you still get excited and feel rewarded. In terms of audio, the game opens up with the sweet upbeat tunes of Celtic Rock, with my brother sitting next to me immediately commenting that while it wasn't the series' main theme, it was that kind of music that the series was overall known for. And going into the game, that notion was only further strengthened. Each area has its own set of tunes that fit the environment and aesthetics perfectly, like the calm and soothing sounds of the Boundary Forest, the more adventurous yet subdued tunes of the Great Plains, the Celtic beats, of the hometown Magnolia or the festive tones of Crocus the Blooming Capital. In an RPG where lots of your time, when you're not watching characters talking, is going to be spent fighting, the main battle theme is, in my opinion, one of the absolute most important things to get right. It mustn't get repetitive or boring too quickly, and I can safely say that this is not the case here, neither for the regular nor boss fights. The heavy tunes of rock quickly got me pumped for battle upon every encounter, with the victory theme, which is also an essential part of the soundtrack for an RPG, being the cherry on top, despite being a 5 second loop. Speaking of characters, because this isn't Naruto or Dragon Ball, Gust apparently couldn't afford or didn't see the need to include English voiceover. It is all in Japanese. 
Listen, I know many of you are purists who want to hear the show in its native language and more power to you, but I would at the very least like to have the choice and seeing how the show does have an official English dub, I simply don't get why it was omitted from the majority of anime games released overseas. I mean, even Studio Trigger had the decency to include English voice track in the Kill the Kill game that I also reviewed, but it is sadly more of an exception rather than a rule. That aside, the music was great, fantastic even in all the right places, and the crunchy sound effects when landing hits only complemented it. In terms of visuals, as I mentioned a couple of times already, this is a Gust game, aka the creators of the Atelier series, and it shows. While the game isn't outright hideous to look at, it is clear that the character models are where they put most of their allowance into, with surrounding environments like trees, leaves, rocks, and some buildings being very low poly on close inspection. And it doesn't feel like an artistic choice either, but rather limitations. If you're a fan of the Atelier series, you may not mind this low budget art style, which can admittedly be pretty and charming in certain places, but it was not for me. In contrast, detailed models, engaging battle system, and the equally impressive and mouth-watering magic attacks lifted from the source material, and the beautiful but rare CG cutscenes, I might not have been so kind overall. It doesn't help the game's case that the same 4 or 5 NPCs are reused more times than my old tennis socks. Despite the low graphical fidelity of the environments themselves, they are admittedly varied with everything from deep forests to towns, beaches, jungles, and snowy mountains. Your attacks are many and varied, and I love the confident stance your characters take when they are awaiting their orders. Especially the detail that they smirk if the highlighted attack is strong against the opponent. The game itself ran very smoothly as well, with few and very brief load times that you can even interact with to pass time like in the Budokai games of old. In general, while the graphics may not be overall top-notch, the game certainly oozes charm and personality, both visually and in terms of dialogue, like when the characters joke around or make pop culture references. It's also worth noting that all of the gameplay you see here was captured with the Switch in docked mode, but I have tested it in handheld mode where it ran smoothly as well, only stuttering if I hit the record button during a busy cutscene. In terms of value, this boy is a high rider, going for an astounding full price of £54.99 in the UK. Though I am hardly surprised, as this is normal for a fully-fledged AAA licensed game, and an anime game at that. I do feel it is a bit steep with the corner skipping in the presentation. It is a lengthy game though, clocking in at more than 50 hours, including story and side quests with a fun and immersive battle system, and a story where you really grow to care for the characters whether you knew them from the beginning or just got to know them now. And let's not forget about the great soundtrack. This ain't no Ultimate Ninja Storm, but to its credit, Fairy Tale at least sports a proper story mode and a fully-fledged 3D world for you to interact with and roam about, which is more than I can say for My Hero 1's Justice 1 and 2, but I would have still put this at least £10 lower. Overall, while not the best in the genre, neither of RPGs nor anime licensed games, for a pioneering step on the western shores, it certainly could have done a lot worse. Nah, that's not fair. It deserves more praise than that. I actually had a lot of fun with this in the 50 plus hours that I played. And while especially the environmental presentation looked like something of a bygone era, the game still sported the art style and visual identity of the show it is based on. And overall, it felt like a love letter to fans of the show where the developers had done their best with the budget that they were given. While a newcomer like me, with next to zero knowledge of the source material, could still have a fun time with it. Would I have bought it if I knew the game started in the middle of the series though? Nah, I might have held off for a price drop or until I'd watched up to that point in the anime. That said, playing the game and having my advisor by my side, it made me a fan of the series, even if I was dropped right in the middle of it. Overall, the game genuinely fits on the positive scale of the spectrum. In a genre that's all too saturated with cheap cash grabs that only sell because of the name, and despite its glaring shortcomings and the parts of the story that I glanced over, I was still very satisfied with the sheer amount of stuff to do, both during the game and and post game. Therefore, I give Fairy Tale a respected 8 out of 10, and hope the success of this means that there will be more Fairy Tale games to come in the future. Alright, many, many thanks to Alex for taking on this mammoth review, dumping 50 hours into the game 
in just a week. He's a hero and we could not have done it without him. As you can hear, my voice is exceptionally poor right now. I'm sure if you've been following me, you know what's wrong with me. Uh, but yeah, this could not have been done without Alex. Nor without you guys for watching. Thank you ever so much, especially if you made it all the way here. That means the world to us. Also, thanks to our YouTube members who support us in what we do. If you want to join them, check down below. Maybe you can be one of our executive producers like Jonathan Rumor, Dane Wilkinson, God of Resin, Ganicus, and Brent McLean. Many thanks to you guys. My voice is absolutely destroyed right now. Uh, we'll see you on the next one.